the uh, Valley of Tarts Littrell, where we were landing, it was a dark, it was a bay-like indentation into the uh, Ring of Mountains around Serenitatis, the recent Serenitatis. Uh, we were going to land right there and did, right in that point there. This is the other spacecraft. That's the uh, uh, command and service module. Uh, Ron Evans is uh, alone at that point. Ron was our, our uh, command module pilot. But he's very, doing something very important. He's using a, uh, a high power telescope, which we call a sextant. It was tied into the navigation system. And, he, and, and we had uh, previously, before our mission, using uh, photography and information from previous missions, identified a few craters down here, the position of which we knew relative to the center mass of the moon. And so what Ron was doing was updating his knowledge of his position relative to the center mass of the moon by, by shooting those craters. Instead of stars, he was shooting craters. Same principle. Uh, as long as you know where the craters are in inertial space. And then that information was processed back on Earth adjusted for the difference between where we were and where he was. And when we came back around the moon, just prior to uh, uh, igniting the rocket to land in the valley, our position information was updated from the ground. And that immediately narrowed the error for our landing from like through, uh, a radius of three kilometers, which would have put us in the mountains if we'd gotten off of that. That's a three sigma error, and it was far too conservative. Nevertheless, down to about one kilometer radius, and, and uh, indeed uh, made it possible for us to land. Well, so Ron was doing a very important thing here. The, uh, but it was all sort of ridiculous because other than Apollo 11, no mission missed its landing point at all. It landed within a few tens of meters of where we wanted to land before we left the Earth. Was, but everybody was conservative, believe it or not, during Apollo 11. <laughs> and that uh, that three sigma was far far more than we needed to worry about. Now that's just to show you where the Challenger landed. And in fact, this picture taken by Ron Evans from orbit was taken after we landed. And that little light colored area right there is where we landed. And it's light colored because the descent engine <clears throat> effluence winnowed away fine material from the surface. And that causes a, a lighter, a higher albedo of what remains. The, uh, I just might mention also that this uh, strange looking plume part here is the uh, remains of an avalanche. It's an actual dust, dust avalanche that came off this mountain in response to some crater events up here and flowed down the mountain and out five kilometers away from the source. So it was a, it was a major avalanche. This mountain, from there to there, is 7,000 feet high. Picture taken from about 60 nautical miles. The, the units are all mixed up here because we built our rockets using an English system of measure. We flew them using a nautical system of measure. And we worked on the moon using a metric system. <laughs> so I apologize if I keep getting them. Uh, uh, I don't think I mix them up. But Nobody would know if you did mix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, let me mention here that 7, 000, uh, 2,100 meters, 7,000 feet here, a little bit lower over here, about uh, about four and a half miles wide here, and the valley itself is about uh, 35 miles long. It's deeper, by the way, than the Grand Canyon. About a mile deep, it's significant. That's the Challenger, uh, our uh, lunar module. Uh, this is the ladder we use to uh, platform and ladder to get down to the surface. The, uh, it always does that. Doesn't like that black background. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, those uh, orange pads that you see here uh, were uh, actually an artifact of the early design that they never really changed because they didn't know when they began that designing this vehicle whether just how what the bearing strength of the surface would be. The bearing strength is very high, so 
who really didn't need pads at large. One young man in, in Australia asked me why we uh, put pizza on them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is what uh, the surface of the moon looked like uh, from the right-hand uh, side of the spacecraft, the Challenger, after we landed. Uh, very typical. Uh, what we could surface of what we call a regolith. The average depth of this polarized debris is about uh, nine meters uh, in this valley. Uh, elsewhere on the moon, uh, on the dark Mari surfaces, the basalt Mari surfaces, it's more like six meters. But we had a bunch of other stuff to mix in with it here. The, uh, this, uh, the base of the mountain's about uh, three and a half miles away. This is one of 16 small restartable rockets with about 50 pounds thrust. Remember I said the big rocket, actually the engines in the big rocket, the largest was 1.5 million pounds of thrust, there were five of them. And uh, that's 50 pounds of thrust, and those 16 rockets enabled us to uh, restart them, uh, enabled us to uh, control the attitude of the spacecraft as we flew in space. <clears throat> Yours truly, uh, uh, Look like I'm having a good time, and I was. Uh, we stood around our underwear a lot. <laughs> but I do want to bring to your attention this vein in my forehead. Uh, there, one of the things that happens when you get into zero or reduced gravity is that fluids shift to your head, or to the upper body. And that vein is distended partly because of that. Uh, it's uh, just a uh, natural reaction because as, we, as I stand here, the fluid is pooling in the lower part of the body, and the heart's pumping away to keep it moving upward. So gravity is a wonderful thing, sometimes. The uh, Gene Cern's checking out, uh, I, haven't, I haven't gotten the uh, higher resolution picture for this, and I apologize. Uh, I'm trying to get it, I just don't have it. This is uh, Cern, and he's driving the lunar rover. Uh, it, uh, the rover weighed about 450 Earth pounds. Anytime I say Earth pounds, divide by six to know what it weighs on the moon. And uh, it could go about, uh, it had four-wheel drive, uh, electric motors on each wheel, uh, front and rear wheel, independent steering if you needed it, uh, and could drive over this kind of terrain about uh, oh, six and a half, seven kilometers an hour full speed. That doesn't sound, uh, uh, miles per hour, excuse me. Uh, that doesn't sound like very much, but remember in one six gravity, anytime you hit a bump, <laughs> You're going to be off the surface. Right? <laughs> and we had it up to uh, something closer to uh, uh, 12 miles an hour going down a hill in one place. And I think even the test pilot CERN regretted doing that. And we were not on the surface. Right? Now this is uh, what a well-dressed uh, geologist astronaut wears on the, on the moon. The, my weight, the suit, and the backpack was about 370 Earth pounds. Yeah, not very much on the moon, which means that you could run across the surface. The suit was flexible enough in the ankle and the hip that you could actually do a cross-country skiing stride and give a little bit of a toe push each time you put your foot down. You, of course, weren't sliding. You were gliding above the surface. And so you could, you could get up to a, a move steadily as fast as a rover could drive if you needed to. And uh, it really was quite, it was a lot of fun. I had learned cross-country skiing in uh, Norway, and so it, uh, I still think it's the best way to move on the moon. Never could convince the pilots of that. They like to hop around. <laughs> but uh, ultimately, I think if you, if you had to, in an emergency, move significant distance, that would be 